Welcome, everybody. 19th edition of the Salt Lunchbox, and we welcome you on Zoom, also on Facebook Live. My name is Dave. I'm the founder of Salt Sport and Life Training. We're a not-for-profit health education organisation looking for every opportunity to try and uh, build on the positives that can emerge out of this difficult and challenging time in our history. Most of you know the aim of our webinar is to inspire and connect. And at the end, we'll give you three main summary points from today and a call to action. As always, we'd love for you to be involved. So there's a QA and a icon at the bottom of your screen and a chat one. And so be involved and um, try to share with all attendees. And, and James, our moderator, will respond as he always does. And we will try as well to respond. We'd like to thank our sponsors, as always, Eastland, FC Business Solutions and Bendigo Bank. Without our sponsor organisations, we wouldn't be able to bring you these webinars. I've been telling you a little bit about the fact that we're going to be conducting Club Reconnect sessions, and we did our first one last night with the mighty Doncaster Hockey Club Premier League women, and we loved it. We had over 30 women hockey players uh, on Zoom and, uh, and we had some new powerful technology. I'll show you some of the results of, of that later, but it was a wonderful discussion where the girls really committed to creating a club that was going to have as its number one objective fun and then reconnection, um, quality care for one another. And uh, yep, they wanted the ball in the back of the net, they talked about, but uh, recognised that the club was something far more than that. It was such an important connection point for people. And our next session is next week with the Surrey Park Footy Club, and I'm, I'm pumped for that. But I'm very pumped for today. Our guest today is Jason Smith, and uh, Jason's going to come on. A close friend of mine, one of very few people that I would consider a, a mentor. He is the founder and CEO of the health group Back in Motion. Voted as Australian Entrepreneur of the Year in 2013. Jason's won a whole host of other business and social impact awards. He's the author of numerous books, including Outside In, Downsize Up Leadership. That's quite hard to say. This book reveals a whole new paradigm regarding leadership and has proven its success in his own incredibly successful business back in motion. So, Jace, welcome. You've, uh, you've come a long way to where Thank you, you are today. So, tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, um... You know, for everybody listening, we all have a story and uh, none, of us, none of us get this far along the path without a few bruises and bumps and some highlights and lowlights. I mean, I, I often describe myself uh, to anyone who's interested in hearing uh, that I'm more of an accidental success uh, and in fact, a very reluctant businessman. I'm a physiotherapist by profession and uh, I have... Uh, kind of journeyed through this maze that we call life, this great adventure. My wife and I actually always wanted to be working in the developing world. That's from a very young age where we thought we would be. Uh, she's an intensive care nurse. Uh, so as two health professionals, we thought that would be a life really uh, worthy of living. And uh, nobody's more surprised than me to find that 20 years on, here we are leading a very large multinational network of healthcare practices. We have about 600 staff. And uh, along the way, uh, I think I have become something of a leadership junkie uh, or a leadership enthusiast because I've realized without it, I'm going to fail. Uh, I'm going to fail under the load of the demand that gets placed on us, treating half a million patients a year and however many staff that look to you for some direction, uh, I needed to upskill. And so it's been this real roller coaster ride coming to terms with the world around me. But, you know, you wouldn't change anything, even the hardship, because we learn so much from it. Mm. So, Jace, um, this word leadership, it's, it's bandied around a lot. There's countless books written on the topic. Uh, everybody seems to be a resident expert in leadership, but you've got a, a slightly different take on it. So um, I'm really um, excited for people listening to hear because I, th I think it's quite transformational the way you view leadership. Tell us how, how it kind of differs to, to your average leadership kind of view. It's pretty embarrassing when you think about how much of a cliche leadership is. And all I'm doing is adding to the narrative with another book 
or another workshop because I, I do a lot of leadership coaching um, at all ends of the spectrum, individual right through to very large groups. But this idea of leadership, I think it's misunderstood. I think leadership is, is, um, is a very, in some ways, simple idea and we have overcomplicated it. And I think there's a lot of confusion between leadership and management, the attributes that uh, really are being um, trained, coached and expected from us out there in the world. Uh, just the other day, I, um, I had about 140 people on a teleconference that I was uh, hosting um, within our own organisation. And we were talking about some very large matters, you know, matters of great import in, in, inside our, our strategy in managing COVID-19. And it was humorous because the moment I clicked off the screen, I got a barrage of email from me or to me, some congratulating me on my exceptional leadership and others questioning me, where is the leadership on this matter? And, it, and it's kind of like, it was exactly the same decision for everyone, but people judge or measure your leadership based on whether it suits them. Yeah. Based on whether the decision was what they wanted, how it impacts them personally. So for me, leadership is not about your title. It's not about your pay grade. It's not about your qualifications. Leadership is not about how big your corner office is. Uh, leadership is not what you say about yourself even. Leadership ultimately is measured by your degree of being able to influence others. It's, it's that very simple idea. Mm. And I don't think that's especially unique in its worldview. Mm. Uh, but what I do hold strongly that I find can raise a few eyebrows and get a little bit of a controversial reaction out there is when I say everybody, everybody, literally everybody can and should be a leader. They should be aspiring to be people of positive and noble influence in the world around them. They might not all make great managers, but they should be exceptional leaders. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is ignite a leadership revolution in our homes, in our schools, in our churches, in our businesses, in our communities. And, you know, with SALT thinking about it in the sporting context, we want leadership revolutions. We want people to have greater influence, not just be uh, mute or neutral or benign in the way they live their lives. Mm. I think um, when we do our leadership courses into clubs like you, we say that everybody is a leader because leadership is simply influence. So if you're the kid at school who puts his head down on the desk and falls asleep in a teacher's class, you're actually a leader. You're influencing people to think a certain way. You're saying, I'm not engaged or I'm not respectful of this teacher. And you're influencing others who, who might follow suit. So all of us have that opportunity to lead. I think back to a couple of years ago when um, the man they dubbed Trolley Man in the city, um, the, the guy was, was trying to stab people and he was a homeless guy with a criminal record, but he got his trolley and he pushed it into the guy and he stopped him from doing any further damage. And so he, he stepped up and, and led situationally there and then. And, you know, also we often say that in sport, if you've got the ball in your hand, uh, then you're determining what's going to happen next. You're, you're, you're leading the narrative from that point on, whether you're a fast bowler with a cricket ball at the top of your mark or a net ball or about to pass it you know, you're, you're making the lead. So I love that, that you talk about we're all leaders and we've got to take that responsibility very seriously. And I think a great metaphor to help people access this idea that we're all leaders, we all have the potential to influence, mm. is the iceberg. Yeah. And uh, we use this iceberg for lots of different analogies. But if you think of it from the leadership perspective, Colloquially, the tip of the iceberg, you know, is, is that superficial, overt, obvious set of attributes that we think define a leader. And uh, what we miss often is that 90% of the mass of that iceberg lies invisible in the unseen world. And they are those attributes from within that actually create the most compelling experience for people around you. And so um, iceberg leadership, as I call it, 
is this wonderful idea that 90% of what's going to make you an effective influencer are the attributes that probably nobody sees, that you develop in the dark when no one else is around you. They are intensely personal and yet they are the things of greatest influence. And so when I speak with our staff at work, for instance, uh, I will say to our newest, youngest, less experienced graduate physios, I expect you to be great leaders. When I talk with my kids at home, and I have four at home, and uh, you know, I expect all of them to have leadership within our home. Mm -hmm. And one of the qualities that makes a great, effective leader is that they know how to follow which is kind of ironic. It's, it's almost counterintuitive. Um, the best attributes of a follower actually become the precursors to what make them exceptional leaders. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've all seen the uh, humorous YouTube video of the crazy dancer. And if you haven't, just Google that after the webinar. Um, and you'll notice that it's, it's not often the guy standing at the front or the first mover who has the greatest influence. It's the second follower and the third who then gives validity to what the first two did. And all of a sudden you start to have influence amongst the masses. Mm. So followership, followership and leadership in my book are a continuum of attributes, not a hard line of two binary options. Mm. We, we sometimes do this activity um, called the levitating tent pole in, uh, in, in footy clubs and they put their fingers out like goal umpires and you rest the, uh, the tent pole on it. And then you, as a group, you've got to lower it together with your fingers under it. And it means to succeed, you've got to have one person take the lead and every other person has to realize that their leadership in that position is to follow and to just go down on the instruction of somebody else. But as soon as you have somebody else trying to steal the lead or instruction, it, uh, it fails. So I, fully get what you're talking about. And that's that interdependence uh, in, in, in sport too, where often we're at our very best. You know, I have a shot on goal, but you have a better shot. So I give it off to you. I give you the glory of the goal for the sake of the team when I could have had a shot myself because I'm, I'm willing in this case uh, to, to allow you to have the limelight. And yeah. I think that's, that's very important. So, so you're touching on teamwork there. Mm. And of course, Teamwork relies on a number of dimensions mm. to be effective. Um, leadership is one of them. Followership is another. And then there's all sorts of other cultural imperatives and visionary alignment and commitment and accountability and various other things. And so I, I think sport is a wonderful place for us to practice, mm. for us to uh, really develop some of those leadership attributes. Mm. Of course, the challenge then is to translate them into the other areas of our life. Mm. And so often we seem to compartmentalize what it is that is important to us. And so home, we behave a little differently. At work, different again, different, different context. And so we put different lenses over who we think we need to be and how we should act. And mm. we mind our place. And if we're not the... The, the titled manager of the team where we're nervous and cautious to invest ourselves into some of these leadership spheres. And my whole agenda is to break down these artificial silos and compartments, give people permission to lead when they're naturally the right person to, to do so. Wow. Uh, the, the, the phrase I repeat continuously is overlead, overlead. Overlead and undermanage. Um, you know, we sometimes get criticised for overmanaging. Yeah. Uh, but I've never had the criticism. Maybe one day it'll come. Maybe that should be my in my ambition to get to a point where I'm actually accused of overleading. Because what do you mean by overlead? I suspect what you're saying is it's about setting the right example in your own leadership. Well, we'll see for me again, we're coming back to this idea that leadership is not much more than having influence. It's not about giving instructions. It's not about telling people what to do. I think it was um, Theodore Roosevelt who said, you know, that this, a great leader is someone uh, who picks great people to do what they love and what they're good at. And then they get out of the way and don't put restraints around them. 
So, so if leadership is about the ability of facilitating, setting direction, gaining commitment and helping change happen, and it's about bringing influence to that sphere, mm. then, you know, you, you, you want to be guilty of doing more and more and yet more of that in the home, in the workplace, on the sporting ground, not less. Yeah. So it's almost impossible to be criticised in a negative way for overleading. But managing is so different. See, managing is where we bring what we think is either self-appointed or others have given you permission to have authority in situations. And we start to give instructions and we start to give direction and we shut down creativity and innovation. And now people are literally being asked to just do what we say. And we wonder why in that vacuum, we don't get the best of them. Mm. And so we're guilty of micro managing or over managing, but, but we should be over leading. Yeah. That's fascinating really, because I, in the last, I spent the first 10 years of my parenting and the first 10 years of my workplace management, trying to make people do things I wanted done that they didn't necessarily see value in. Mm. And we, and we called that leadership or management, but frankly, it was just illogical. And I've spent the last 10 years trying to give people context and discover their own desire to achieve in the respective areas and then just facilitate for them mm. an opportunity. Mm. And it makes me look a whole lot better than I really am, to be honest. I do remember, and it seemed quite innovative at the time when I first read it, that big organisations like Apple and, and Google uh, went out on a limb and actually said to their people, we're going to give you a day a week to just explore something that you're passionate about that's related to our business, but we won't tell you what to do or how to do it. And so people immediately started to think about their own strengths and their own passions and how they could benefit the business by being in those. And that sense of trust and empowerment were, were very strong motivators for great innovation to happen. And I just think right now with the time that we're going through where people have had to work from home, surely companies are now seeing a different side of people where they've had to be trusted, haven't they, to be productive from their own homes. But hopefully too, people have been far more creative during this time in how they might you know, serve their organizations. And I'd be interested to hear about your perspective, particularly back in motion, as we've gone through this really difficult period, um, how, how have you adapted your leadership and, and, and have you been able to empower your people more or, or less during this period? So I think any, any time a change is imposed on you, you are faced with really in the simplest of explanations, one of two options. You either rise to the challenge and, and, you, and you do find new opportunities that you can harness or you get flattened by it. Um, any change that happens to us outside of our control, we call disruption. Uh, any change we create from our own locus of control, we call innovation. It's interesting. It's just in the language, so much in a word. In, in our instance, Dave, um, so we're, we're a healthcare network um, and so personal services is is the uh, inescapable format of our business. And even though we provide lots of healthcare through digital services and um, online consultations, the truth is the core of our business relies on face-to-face -face personal interaction. Uh, in New Zealand, we got shut down completely at level four um, restrictions. In Australia, we're running at about half speed. And I've had to learn how to lead an organisation by remote control yes. because we just haven't had what I call the benefit of the whole five senses. So I can't sit with somebody, I can't eyeball their uh, body language, I can't necessarily read the pulse of the room because I'm not in it with them. And uh, you know, it, I think on my, my heaviest day, I had 18 Zoom calls in one day. And you have to draw on other inputs to be able to influence people when you've only got a little box on a screen and there's literally hundreds of other people tuning into it and i don't think it's a bad thing i think it's wonderful to develop other powers of observation and other means of influence and so um, i think we will become a little more ambidextrous in our leadership qualities going through these sorts of changes 
it's, it's not that I'm not looking forward to getting back into the room with people. I am. But I think we can all still have influence. And I would caution anybody to let themselves off the hook mm -hmm. during these extended months of isolation. This is when we want to be having more influence. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find creative ways to do that. Mm. When we had Zach Seidler come on and, and speak at, um, earlier, he said that, like you did, that we've got less chance to observe each other in action physically. Um, but in compensating, we've had to learn to ask better questions. And, and so people who struggle to do that have no excuse. This is a shared experience. And we know that many people are struggling and we have to ask really good questions. And so I'd like to ask you, just the power of a good question versus the power of a good statement and, and yeah. how you've used that to affect in your leadership. So I, I use the, the term questioneering, uh, just like the idea of engineering, which is, you know, the developing of some infrastructure to be able to support a load. I, I think questioneering is the reverse engineering of smart questions that lead people on a path to making good decisions. And I think leaders ask far more questions and managers are inclined to give many more answers. Mm. And ironically, if you look at the way our society works, the person who's asking the question tends to be in control of the conversation. Mm. So mum and dad ask the kid, where have you been? The teachers ask, you know, what, what's the answer to this problem? Um, police officers pull us over and courts in, judges in courts ask the questions. They tend to be in control. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can have powerful influence by asking intelligent questions at the right time. Mm -hmm. Very practically, um, I, um, I, I set myself on a daily basis, a mental uh, challenge to try to rarely give answers. But when I walk in and out of lots of different meetings and I'm part of a team-based approach to problem solving, I just look to ask meaningful questions. Mm. Rarely am I the smartest guy in the room anyway. And so I probably don't have the right answer, but I can ask edgy questions. And questions that are smart cause people to think around corners, look into the future. Um, as you've just mentioned, uh, kind of almost do an inventory on their lived experience so they can learn from what they've actually um, experienced in other contexts. And I think it's important that we do get better at asking questions. So I have a rule when anybody comes to me and they ask me a question where they expect me to solve the problem for them. I say to them, look, I'm happy to give you my opinion, but I'm not going to give you any instruction. In fact, I sign off a lot of my emails internally with um, O-N-I, opinion, not instruction. So I have an opinion on just about everything, but I don't necessarily have the answer for everything. Mm. And I think what this creates is freedom for people to take risks and think creatively and try something new. And in the process, even if only two out of 20 of their initiatives work, man, we are two great advances better off than we were yesterday. No, that, that's great. Uh, you, you, you're right. People feel far more engaged in the conversation when they're invited to have their opinion. And I think far less judged. We um, often start presentations in clubs. And if we're doing, for instance, a, a drug and alcohol session or a respect and equality session, sometimes the audience will think we're going to come in and lecture them. Don't use drugs and alcohol. Be respectful to women. And they can be almost defensive. But if we start by saying, what kind of club do you want to be? What kind of impact do you want to have on your community? What kind of influence do you want to have on the kids coming up? And, and, and where do drugs and alcohol fit into that? And where does respect and equality fit into that? And we ask them those questions. They'll typically dig deep. And we find that most people want to be the best version of themselves. And when asked the question, um, they'll actually say, no, we want to be a good influence. And we don't see a, a role for drugs at our social events or a, an abuse of alcohol. And yet we never actually had to say it. And I think this is really important particularly in relation to parenting. And we've had a, a couple of sessions on parenting, but I think a lot of our listeners are, are, are parents. And, um, you know, we also have this positive uh, parenting course where, again, we talk about those um, frameworks of, of trust and, and good questioning. And, you know, we're, we're going to have um, 
Les Twentyman on, on Monday talking about um, our kids and, and the friends that they choose. And again, I think as a parent, we can just ask really good questions. You know, what what's the criteria when you're choosing your friends? And, and, and tell me the qualities of, of Johnny or Peter, etc. So I'm just, you know, finding all sorts of ties between what you're saying and the things that we, we do in clubs. We're starting to come towards the end of our session. So, Jace, if you were to summarise good leadership in just a couple of sentences, could you do that for us? Well, well, probably not, but I'll have a go. Um, I, I think leadership is mostly about your ability to have influence in the world around you. And if you see yourself as somebody who has the potential for impact and, and, and a worthy contribution to either the home or the team at work you sit in or on the field with your sporting colleagues, then you are robbing them when you don't speak up, when you don't live out your convictions and you don't actually give some oxygen to your view. And so I'm encouraging everybody to, to have this internal leadership revolution. So everybody can lead regardless mm. of what position they're in. I think um, taking on authority, say yes to opportunities when people are giving you the responsibility to make decisions. Enjoy mm. learning and failing forwards and maybe tripping over a few mistakes and hardships. It's a wonderful way for you to advance. And I would say, not that we've touched on it, but as a, as a quick throwaway line there, Dave, I would say, um, if you can find a way to bring some peer accountability into your world and not rely on managers from above, to hold you in line, then what you'll start to experience is a genuine sense of togetherness and teamwork. Because when we hold each other to account to our leadership aspirations, uh, we really do start to glue together the composite of all the different skills and attributes within the team that we are reliable on. I love that term peer accountability. I think we see it a lot in sport. You know, if, if we take a game of footy at quarter time, at three quarter time, they come into their line huddles and each one holds the other one accountable. I think you left too much room for your man to get off you there. And they, they do it in the context of sport. As a teacher, I found we almost never did it. One teacher is fearful of holding another teacher accountable, perhaps for the fear that they'll be judged by the same standard or, or something. Um, at, at SALT, we're, we're very much into um, that peer feedback. Um, and I'll often say, you can tell me anything about this course. I won't take offence. And when they start pulling it to shreds, I do take offence, but I pretend that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, when I look back on it, I go, actually, that was really good advice and I needed it and we improved the course and, uh, and that's how we move forward. I'd, I'd love to spend more time talking about that peer accountability, but I reckon it's, it's very, very powerful. Uh, in the two minutes that we've got left, I'm going to share my screen and um, just um, review what we've talked about today. You should be able to see there on the screen, it says, uh, over lead and under manage. You can lead from any position. And I love that. Distributed authority empowers true freedom and responsibility. And that requires a leader, of course, with the humility to say, I'm not going to be the autocrat. I'm not going to be the manager. I'm actually going to let you lead in the areas that you're stronger than I and that the business needs you to lead in or the family needs you to lead in or the sports club. And peer accountability, that last one, is the holy grail, you say, of high performing teams. Each person holding the other accountable and having that interconnectedness and also not just accountable, but saying, I, I care about the standard that you bring to our club, but I care about you as a person as well. And, and if you're struggling, I want to know, um, not just pure accountability, but that peer care and concern. Um, practice selling, not telling. Every day at home and work, resist the urge to give instructions, opinions only. We just had a fire drill in the apartment that I live and the voice was an autocrat. You said, get out of the building now. And there, sometimes I guess is a time when, uh, you know, you've just got to take the lead and say, do what I tell you to do. But mostly it's far more, isn't it, about selling what it is that you'd love other people to invest into uh, and bring the best out in them. So on Monday, we've got Les Twentyman. He writes for the Herald Sun. He's often in the media. He's quoted for his views on, uh, on youth, and he's had a lot of work to, uh, in the Western suburbs with, with gangs and with mentoring and with bringing kids out of dark situations into much brighter futures. And so what a, a privilege to have Les joining us 
on Monday. We hope you'll join us to hear from him. There are three wonderful sponsors, FC Eastland and Bendigo Bank, whom we must always acknowledge. And we do so not because we have to, we love them. If you've missed any of the sessions, and I reckon this would be a good one to forward to your friends, go to our Facebook site or our website to get the link to the YouTube channel that has them all uploaded shortly after we finish. That's our club reconnect info at Sport and Life Training if you would like us to conduct one. We do have quite a bit of funding available for various clubs in various regions, not everywhere, but worth finding out whether your club qualifies for a free session, club reconnect online. About 75 minutes, we reckon we need to do it really well, we've learnt. That's from our last club reconnect that we did last night with the Doncaster Hockey Club. And so we've got all these different ways of measuring responses and they were feeling uncertain, anxiety, lonely, not seeing friends, but the ways to deal with it, exercise, dog walks, baking, walking, Netflix, cooking. We had lots of great discussions. That's the number for Netflix. My goodness, for Lifeline. <laughs> not Netflix, for Lifeline. Shouldn't say it that way. And we want to give you a very big thank you, Jace. Thanks to our audience. So there were lots of comments today that we didn't get to, but I could see Lane and Edwina and James, you know, our regular panellists and moderators answering those questions. And so there was discussions within discussions, Jace, about what you were talking about. Half an hour wasn't enough, but thank you. Bless you. Keep up the wonderful work that you do. Uh, and thanks for your, your wonderful care for us at Salt. We're going to sign off now. Thanks, everybody.